this language. Um, Maria Claudia is my teacher. Uh, Ana Luisa e Ana Luisa e yeah, Claire. Ah não, uh, Alex Hid. Good. Can you check, please, the order of the presentations? Because I can't see it right now. See, sí, um, first it's me, mm, okay. uh, after Ana Luisa, and uh, in the end, Alex. I think it's a man, Alex. And Claire? I'm ah, sorry, I Claire. Ah, no, Claire. Ah. Sorry, Claire. Okay. Okay, well, I think we could probably just start and then Alex can join us. That is the first, the first one, yeah. If, um, I don't know, um, son, um, pen? <laughs> son. <laughs> <laughs> I will be crazy. <laughs> it's mixing no the Spanish together with the English. <laughs> Spanish in English, Portuguese. I will be crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I will survive. Uh, well, um, I think we we can start. Um, okay. Gonna, um, I think so. yes, but um, we can um, wait to Alex. If you prefer. And what's the name of the this woman who is in charge of the session? I couldn't. Marsha. Marsha, okay. Yes, okay. who is? Ah, here you are. So we started we... to begin, Marsha. Is that, all, is that all right for you? Yeah, of course. If you if you prefer to start. Okay. The... We we are faithful that public is coming. <laughs> <laughs> But at least we'll have an interesting discussion between us. Okay, I'm okay. Absolutely. <laughs> so uh, we. I thought so, Claire first. Claire, no? I can go first. I thought I was going last, but I can go first. Ah, I don't. Can I? I can definitely go first. It's not a problem. It's just I, I zoom out the most from the classroom, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, fantastic then. I guess that I'll just go. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, it is nice to meet you all over Zoom. Um, my name is Claire Kayan. I am a PhD candidate at the Graduate Center at the City University of New York. And my field is actually environmental psychology. So it's more at the border between human geography and psychology. And it's really about the relationship between people and place, how places impact people and people impact places. And um, for the past few years, uh, for my dissertation, I've been looking at the privatization of schools in Newark, uh, New Jersey, which is a town of about 200, or city actually, of 280,000 people or so in New Jersey. And so actually my presentation is about teacher unions and urban crises, and I pre-recorded it. Um, so it probably has the largest, it's more outward about the city uh, than about the classroom, but you'll see why uh, in the presentation. And I pre-recorded it 
because my internet has been kind of unstable and I was really worried that uh, I would freeze. So I'm just going to share my screen so that you all can see it and should be about 15 minutes. Oh. And so you should now see the presentation. Yes. Okay, fantastic. My name is Clark Ann. I am a PhD candidate you hear the sound? At, the graduate, at the Graduate Center at the City University of New York. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about teacher unions, urban crises, and the reaffirmation of the public good. So this presentation is about crises of public welfare in US, in US cities which manifests through things like the poisoning of the air and water, poverty, hunger, and homelessness. These are crises that preceded the pandemic and will undoubtedly last well beyond it. But mainly, this presentation is about how public school teachers have taken responsibility for addressing this despair and for repairing cities that are tearing at the scene. My research draws from an extended several year case study of Newark, New Jersey, a former industrial center in the US that began to shrink in the 1970s and today is a city that is quite poor, non white, very young, and a city where the water is being poisoned by lead. So I'd like to start by delving right into the specificities of this case and the issue of lead poisoning of the city's water system, which is kind of central to what I'm exploring here. So I'd like to play a video that, exp that captures some of what is going on. Well, initially in February of 2018, NRDC approached an organization I'm a part of, and that is New Caucus, which is Newark Education Workers Caucus. We are the plaintiff along with NRDC in the federal lawsuit. And they approached us and said, I don't know if you're aware, there is lead in the water in Newark. And actually, your numbers are rivaling Flint. So when we heard this, we were taken aback and extremely flabbergasted. So we said we had no idea. And they said, we're looking for a plaintiff and would you serve as this? So as educators, we said, absolutely. We were concerned about our students, of course, and residents of the city of Newark in general. And then I am a homeowner. So I was really concerned. Um, eventually, I had my home tested. I'm at 44.2 parts, which is almost three times the federal action level. So um, once we said we're filing, the mayor said everything is fine and there is no problem. So we were concerned about that. He was an educator, though. I'm concerned about cognitive issues in my classroom. And I see that every day. So what is remarkable about this case is actually not so much that the population is being poisoned, not so much that the city government is denying that there is a problem at all. In many ways, those things are part of the American industrial st story and they're part of the American post-industrial story. What I do find remarkable is that teachers are the ones on the front lines and they're acting through their unions when that high school teacher or vet in that video says she's part of the new caucus, that's a union group. So through their unions, teachers are the ones who are serving as movement leaders and calling for the replacement of the city's lead contaminated pipes. And what's even more remarkable is actually, or what's notable, I should say, is that teachers in Newark are not alone in acting as public advocates. Throughout the country, from Chicago to Los Angeles to Oakland, there are teachers who are organizing for demands that go well beyond the classroom. These include asking for things like affordable housing and an end to student deportations. And what is interesting is that this revival in teacher unionism is coming at a time when other unions are declining. These unions are, teacher unions are reviving. They're drawing on a social democratic tradition. And so my presentation looks at this phenomenon and asks, why teachers? Why are teachers fighting for more egalitarian cities? Why are they using the union as a vehicle to get to this goal? And why are they doing so now in this present conjuncture? 
So I'd like to begin by answering the last of these questions, why now? Because I think in many ways the answer lies in the very topic that brought us together for this conference, which is the protracted, recurrent, and extreme nature of the crises that we are living through. In a wonderful keynote speech last week on the imaginative co-construction of past and future, it was noted that this global pandemic causes us to wonder how close we are to the dystopian future of our nightmares, to the dystopian future of novels like 1984. Have we already arrived? It was also noted that in the Marxist traditions, these kinds of questions really cannot be answered or resolved in our minds, but require an engagement with our specific material conditions. It is through engagement with our material conditions, with the specificities of people and place, that we can actually begin to also change our consciousness and move to political action. Collectively, this is actually something that has been happening for at least the past decade in Newark. From 2010 forward, the city saw its greatest uprising since the civil rights movement. You have here in the slide a picture of a new Newark public st school student walkout that occurred in 2015. Thousands of schools walked off their school property in the middle of the school day. Um, and the fight here was for educational justice. I won't give too much background on it, but I will say that the outcome of this years long movement that involved students, parents, teachers, politicians, it was actually the election of a new mayor to the city. That mayor was a former high school principal, and he was also the son of a prominent black power activist. So he came from this activist tradition. The disappointment that occurred following these movements, though, is that not much has changed. The situation continues to deteriorate, and especially today, between lead poisoning and COVID, teachers and students alike are confronted to a devaluation of human life and a lack of political leadership willing to defend the public welfare. In fact, as you saw in the video, the city's reaction has been to normalize the crisis, say there's no problem. So teachers are stepping into this vacuum to name and define the crisis, to say we don't have access to the basic necessities of life, and we are going to do what we can to restore that, to restore our access. The question though remains as to why teachers are the ones leading this fight. And here, I want to be careful not to naturalize or essentialize uh, the kind of care that teachers bring to their profession. But there is a material pro uh, a reality of the work that teachers do, which is that it's relational. It involves ties for students, for uh, ties with students, ties with parents, ties with other teachers and city residents. And it also necessitates some level of hope and confidence in urban futures. In many ways, teachers have front row seats to the various crises that we experience. And as one teacher told me in an interview, it's pretty hard not to see the connections between what happens in my classroom and what happens in Newark. In other words, degradations between teacher working conditions, student learning conditions, and resident living conditions are all mutually constituted. In more Brock and Brennerian terms, teachers also see the ways that crises are nested. So while lead poisoning may start in people's homes, as Yvette, the high school teacher, notes in the video, this poisoning actually impacts cognitive development and learning ability in the classroom. Then if you scale back up to the neighborhood, the city is only fixing the problem in wealthier neighborhoods. They're not replacing pipes in poorer neighborhoods. So this increases inequality throughout the city, and at a more macro level, this condemns students in poorest neighborhoods to what Kramer calls premature death and failing reproduction. These are the very structural conditions that reinforce class. And at the same level where our values and our ideals are formed and circulate the same macro level, trust in government is eroding, and it reinforces the sentiment that we are living in our own worst nightmare. So why are unions the vehicle through which this nightmare might be ended? Why are they the vehicles through which to fight for urban justice for more egalitarian cities? And I think the effects of contagion are not to be overlooked because for a long time, unions have been the preeminent working class organizations that allow workers who have no power individually to have power together as a collective. But it was only in 2012 that teacher unions began to revive, thanks in large part to the efforts of, of Chicago teachers, teachers in Chicago public schools, who that year 
formed a social justice caucus that was focused, again, on building a more egalitarian city and fighting for investment in schools. They successfully took over their union, went on strike, and won several key demands. Following this victory, they published this short monograph, How to Jumpstart Your Union, Lessons from the Chicago Teachers. And many teachers, by all accounts, from cities, cities across all four corners of the US are actually using this book as a step-by-step -step blueprint for leading similar efforts. So too has the book Shock Doctrine by Naomi Klein been extremely important. The term disaster capitalism is now part of common sense discourse for teachers who are activists. They know, to, they know that crises are outlets of, for capital accumulation, and they expect that this accumulation will occur at the expense of public welfare. So the tools are available for both an analysis of the pattern kind of conditions that are arising across the U.S., as well as for action. This makes union revival more possible. And while that is very hopeful, the path forward is riddled with challenges. One of these is that teachers have to make clear that they are on the side of the public, even while they protect their own health and that of their students. In a dysfunctional political economy, that is not an easy tension to navigate. And not, not to return to in-person teaching until there is a vaccine. Some are immunosuppressed and feel that death is knocking at their door. Many have families they worry about infecting. But they also know from their daily, albeit virtual interactions with students, that many families in Newark right now are desperate. Not only has the job market contracted and unemployment was already quite high before, but because of the additional responsibilities that parents have to take care of young children who would otherwise be in school, many may not be able to look for work, even if they want to. One teacher I spoke with was in touch with a family um, who had lost their job and they had fallen behind on their water bill. Speaking of water, their water had been shut off. And for the past week, they had been drinking uh, water from the toilet reservoir. Um, these are the kinds of stories that teachers hear day in and day out in poor cities. And it reminds them that schools are critical spaces of social reproduction, not just because they provide education, but because they, they provide the very basic necessities of life that I've been talking about this entire presentation. Schools provide shelter, schools provide food, lunch and breakfast for students, and schools provide free childcare. For teachers to oppose going back to work is to risk betraying parents and families who are desperate. On top of this, the threat of privatization is looming. All across the US, there are capitalist interests that want to convert public schools to private institutions. And in Newark, there's actually a large contingency that wants to make online learning permanent. They are already on the move. One of these main and most powerful advocates in Newark um, has talked about how he does not intend to let this crisis go to waste, how the pandemic is a chance to reevaluate education. And in a recent interview with a local newspaper, he engaged in what teachers have come to call teacher baiting, saying that he feared that most of the help that would come in the wake of this crisis would go to the adults, that is to say teachers and not to the children, that is to say, students. This is one of the most common motifs of attacks on public schools, which is to perpetuate a false dichotomy between uh, students and teachers, an argument that somehow what is good for students is bad for teachers or what is good for students is bad for teachers. This is the very dichotomy that teachers in Newark and elsewhere are trying to, ref th that they're trying to refuse. And they're trying to say that any political change has to be comprehensive. It has to be for the public good. And a public is comprised of adults and children. It's a public that has rights. It includes all residents that must be engaged in public life. And it's a public to whom local government owes a basic responsibility that currently they are abdicating. So I'd like to conclude by saying that this research began several years ago. And already then, much of my focus was on crisis. I knew that I was researching a city that had been in a, in a protracted state of emergency. Many of my informants were people who lived and worked in Newark their entire lives. When they spoke of schools and the cities, they made remarks such as, things are worse now than in the Great Depression, or it wasn't so bad when I was in school. The narrative was one of deterioration, a downward trajectory that nothing could seem to stop. 
Today, we enter a new conjuncture, and I think the fear for many of us is that things will continue to get worse. I am reminded here of this passage from Stuart Hall, who wrote, the, who wrote, in an, essay, who wrote an essay on the pertinence of Gramsci for our, for our own scholarship today. Stuart Hall writes, Gramsci face, came face to face with the revolutionary character of history itself. When a conjunction rolls, there is no going back. History shifts gears, the terrain changes, you are in a new moment. You have to attend violently with all of the pessimism of the intellect at your command to the discipline of the conjuncture. In addition, and this is one of the main reasons why his thought is so pertinent to us today, Gramsci had to face the capacity of the right and specifically of European fascism to hegemonize that defeat. The advantage of living in an era riddled by recurrent crises is that teachers are by now well acquainted with the capacity of the right to hegemonize their defeats. There is more infrastructure among teachers to fight back against austerity as recently as 2008. And for all of us here who remember the waves of privatization and cuts that followed that last global financial cra crash, that is very good news that there's more infrastructure. And while there is deeper poverty, despair, and alienation, alienation and isolation, there is also a greater shared good sense of what needs to be done, of the need to reinvest in public welfare and revive social democratic traditions. There is more political space to maneuver. And teachers are saying, let's go. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, you, Claire, suggest that, that we had to uh, a, a discussion after each talk or... Or at the end. Okay, what do you think? At, at the end. Your, your, your phone is off. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Okay. See, uh, after the, this, the, the all presentations, we will do a discussion. Yes. Perfect. Okay. So now it's my turn. So, okay. Uh, like uh, Claire, I also prepared a video too. Uh, I will share my screen. But uh, have me. Let me introduce myself. <laughs> I'm Ruth. Uh, I live in Brazil. Um, I'm a student, doc doctorate student. Uh, Maria Claudia is my profession. Uh, in this time, I'm living in Barcelona during a year uh, as a part of my doctor doctorate. And um, Maria Claudia will help me during the discussion too. Uh, let me see. All right. Ruth, o som está bem baixo. The soundtrack's not okay, Ruth. Sim. Um minuto. Uh, Would you please restart it? Está Pode much better. De, é, começar okay. de novo. Maybe you have to louder your your computer sound. Listen now? Yes, it's better. Ruth, it's not working. It's not working. It's very buff, uh, a lot of buffing in the sound. It's difficult to understand, at least for myself, what to think about that goes. Yeah. Are you if you if you go to share screen, uh, 
when you when you're opting to share your screen have you clicked the options at the bottom to share audio and to optimize the performance do you see that no problem i can i can explain i can in the share screen option okay I don't know what what happened. I don't know what happened because I do some tests before and uh, not no problem. Uh, did you did you see my my screen? You, uh, we see our screen, your screen, and I we don't know if it would be interesting to try again. To just to adjust soundtrack and try again, Hooch? Or would you prefer to comment on it directly? What's your option yeah, right yeah, now? No, no problem. I will a presentation now. No problem. Okay. Well, um, I'm here uh, with Maria Claudia um, to present to share uh, some reflections that I'm doing in my doctor result about the, the mediation of uh, information communication technologies in the activities of teachers uh, at a school in Brazil. Uh, well, uh, in this scenario of social inequalities made more evident uh, during the pandemic, we call this presentation uh, as in the same year, but in the different boats, educational inequalities, um, remote classes and pedagogical innovation in times of uh, global crisis. Um, as everyone knows, uh, this pandemic was uh, a surprise and uh, it has been present huge um, challenges to humanity. Uh, one of these challenges was to close uh, school and start doing uh, school activities at home. Uh, according to UNESCO, 19% uh, of students uh, worldwide, as show in this map on, on the right. Um, uh, sorry, 98%, uh, according to UNESCO, the closure of school impacted around 98% of students worldwide. Um, if you want the one hand, uh, some children can stay in the comfort of the home and study with the parents and teachers. Um, for the one on the hand, um, there are some children that uh, suffer violence and feel hungry and cannot study properly. Um, we have in Brazil some, some big problems and social inequalities uh, were even more exposed during the pandemic. According to results uh, carried out in times of war uh, and the humanitarian crisis, uh, many children uh, and young people don't return to school, uh, increase uh, school dropout rates. rates. Um, besides possible to, to observe impairments uh, in children's cognitive and social development. For instance, in family, um, in family with a limited financial resource, the children may need to work and uh, to help support the, the home. So in this context, uh, in order to reduce the impact uh, on development and the school learning, UNESCO recommended use technology, uh, resource and distance education. Uh, social inequalities already exist, of course, but uh, during the pandemic, uh, they are being felt uh, much more in many parts of the world. Um, and in Brazil, we have the, an addiction, uh, the political stability, uh, that is result in a confused management to fight the, the pandemic. Uh, the Bolsonaro government um, is ignoring all scientific data and uh, has been encouraged the, the population to keep the, the economic active. Um, this position is clear, um, economic security first. Uh, two ministers were, uh, were uh, dismissed from the positions of health minister for disagreeing uh, with Bolsonaro. As a consequence, the incidence uh, of the virus and the mortality 
by COVID-19 increase in Brazil. Uh, here, a map. Uh, today, we are the second country most affected by the COVID. Um, the, the states most affect uh, São Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, um, Ceará and the Amazonas. For sure, the social inequalities like income, gender, race, sex to health and education, it's been felt significantly. Uh, despite uh, the Bolsonaro actions, the Brazilian states and municipalities uh, have ensured measures to face um, to the, uh, the disease. Uh, the face-to-face -face classes were interrupted uh, and uh, it was allowed to adopt a remote education. However, as uh, access to technology, it's a uh, reality for all students. Uh, education as a social right has been uh, called into a question. Um, to assist um, the discussion, we present some data. Uh, according to UNICEF, more than 4 million children in Brazil live in homes with no access uh, to internet. Uh, in population whose family income is below the minimum wage, 78% of the people have limited access uh, to the internet exclusively through uh, cell phones. So uh, we can ask, you know, um, how it's possible for children to, to, to study only by cell phone. Uh, perhaps a teenager can't, but the same logic cannot be applied for, for everyone, for younger children, for instance. Besides, the Brazilian states and the federal government isn't being converted actions to improve access to technologies and uh, for the mediation of remote activities. In this way, Educational inequality is increasing in Brazil. On the one hand, school whose students have more financial resources uh, and cultural resources to access to technology is guaranteed, and uh, the learning process hasn't been interrupted. Uh, classes take place only exactly in the same model as the classroom. Uh, here, uh, they are um, students narrative. Uh, we can read together. Uh, I get up at uh, just about the same time, get dressed, have breakfast, and go to the computer. The teacher gives the classes and the PowerPoint on the screen works as a block vote. They give us some time to ask a question and to do the, the exercise. On the other hand, sorry. I'm not, I, I don't know because we're not changing the, the, the slide share. Is it an option or you forget to? Oh, for me, it's, it's, it's normal. Uh, uh, for myself, it isn't. I'm just in the same screen since the beginning. I'm I, sorry, just go ahead. Uh, okay. Right. Well, um, school whose students um, have a few results. Digital technology is uh, now easily access to, to students and parents and teachers. Um, in general, uh, the classes was interrupted um, and um, no much alternative to, to families and the students. Uh, here uh, we put a narrative of your mother, uh, then talking about uh, exclusion, uh, educational exclusion. The imaging solution presented by the education department have so far been distanced from the family. My children have, um, have need a cell phone, no money for buying credit. So the exclusion in government actions and not considering the reality of many families. Considering the, the social inequalities in Brazil and uh, drawing on a sociocultural approach, uh, your aim uh, in this presentation is to discuss the relationship between the use of ICT in the basic, basic education and its relation with innovation and teacher during the after the pandemic. And it's important to say that basic education includes children uh, of literacy age uh, until the end of the high school. From the ZERM, uh, we ask some questions. Uh, does the use of ICT at the current time lead to innovation in, in teaching practices? 
uh, how can we benefit from the general adoptions of ICT to promote genuine educational innovation in post-pandemic teaching practices? We assume that the ICT aren't just technical tools, uh, they are cultural artifacts with the potential to improve high psychology uh, functions, such as to represent, to memorize, and so on. Um, that is why we call these technologies as a semi majors. As a cultural artifact, ICT presents limits and potentialities. Uh, they come from culturally constructed means and are constantly renewed uh, after the experimentations of new uses uh, and outcomes. In addiction, we assume the innovations are psychological, dynamic, dialogical, and temporary, and especially, especially situated process. Uh, it, and uh, this process converge moments of continuity and the discontinuity in development. Uh, in the other words, um, innovation contemplates both cumulated knowledge and the knowledge that emerge from the need to face new uh, challenges uh, which saturate uh, previous knowledge. So, as uh, many teachers didn't know how to use technologies, neither had experience with remote mediation, uh, these new challenges uh, may result in new experiences and uh, new meanings uh, related to the teacher's uh, self-images and the reflections on how ICT can be used to innovate uh, the practice. Uh, as we we so, saw uh, in the student's narrative uh, before, uh, many teachers uh, replicate the knowledge from the classroom experience to the new virtual environment without uh, thinking about what, what it's happened, uh, what, what it's mean, actually. Uh, so at the first time, the use of ICT tends to be purely technical. Uh, besides, depends on previous knowledge about the pedagogical uses of ICT teachers uh, might experience feelings such as security, insecurity and frustration, uh, but we believe these challenges and uh, the new experience are important uh, to teachers rethink yourself and uh, your practice. We believe on that uh, because culture active facts take uh, on meaning from people's experiences uh, based on the quality of the experiences. Uh, the innovation can occur whenever teachers converge their pedag pedagogical needs uh, and intentions in tension with the possibilities uh, and the limitations of the culture reactive facts. Um, considering the use of ACT, um, the self-reflections about this process, of course, with intentionality and pedagogical planning, teachers can able to explore the ICT and move on to, to even more innovative uh, pedagogical uses. Um, so, as final consideration, uh, the mere introductions of new elements uh, in teachers' practice uh, doesn't mean innovation. Um, the innovation can occur whenever new technology devices are transformed into semi mediators uh, of a different perception of your own self and uh, uh, of the classroom. Uh, in this process is successful whenever uh, it's entirely the teacher's social and emotional involvement, self-reflections, planning and motivation, and most of all, um, when it supports uh, the management con contradiction and the emotion that impose in discontinuity on the professional habits and ingrained in values. Uh, well, the teacher can help to reduce educational inequalities uh, by becoming more aware of um, what they can do pedagogically with technologies. Um, even though students don't have uh, access to, to technology, uh, the teacher can innovate uh, by placing himself uh, in the role of the students, um, giving learning scared for uh, based on the real needs um, of their students at the moment. Um, put um, emotionally all the students in the same boat. Well, here are the main references that I uh, supported your reflections, like Bakhtin, Cesar Kog, Laviano, Hermas, Vausnen, Vygotsky. 
Um, that's it. Thank you for your patience. Um, I, Maria Claudia, are here to, to answer any questions. Okay. Now I'm going to share with you uh, my presentation and uh, after we can start the talk, okay, the discussion. Hochi, uh, could you please take off your presentation, please? Okay. Well, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna introduce myself. Uh, my name is Ana Luisa. I am from Brasilia, Brazil and uh, I am a teacher at the uh, Instituto Federal de Brasilia. Uh, I work with Huchi and uh, today I am a PhD student at a psychology program on, in University of Bahia, Salvador, Brazil. And uh, this is a, a, a work in progress because I just started the PhD program, so uh, this is a kind of some contributions, theoretical contributions to my my whole project that is in progress. And, and uh, I wrote with my advisor, that is Pina Marcico. And uh, the, name, the name of this uh, presentation is Identifying Crisis in Teacher's Identity. And I first wanted to talk about crisis in teachers' profession, that uh, crises are faced by teachers uh, since they started work working as one. So in that changing context, we teachers have to create new strategies to cope with the students, policies, and colleagues. So uh, this situation that we are living today, it's another one type of crisis that we face it every day in classroom. And uh, I started to understand the teachers as uh, and, and the uh, innovation in education as a development pathway that we can understand by thinking about uh, what Vygotsky said, uh, that a crisis is uh, another kind of development. So in the sense, we can consider teachers in permanent development, uh, and uh, this could be a, a turning point to uh, study and uh, thinking about uh, teachers' identity. Uh, there is, I, I was wondering about uh, what is teacher's identity and uh, the difference between teacher's identity and identity process. Uh, in educational research, we have a, a, a very, a, a very difference between these, these two concepts. So I think psychology uh, can contribute to think and researching uh, what is identity process uh, instead uh, teachers identity as a stable stable thing so for tatil teachers identity in a professional dimension that he calls a teacher professional identity can be defined in terms of knowledge teacher training and the self self awareness personalities characteristics and uh, as a unique process happen different ways for each person, crises in teacher's identity can be studied through educational self. And I think this concept of educational self can contribute to see a teacher's as identity as a process. And uh, the, uh, the way we can bother uh, and uh, thinking about policies, uh, relationship between students, between other teachers. 
So for Marsico and the Yanacon, the educational self can be conceived as a process of sense making on the move, referring to the past, but at the same time shedding light on the future development of self. So uh, in the abstract I sent to the, the Congress, I was thinking about and wondering how teachers are always thinking of past experience to deal with the present situations. So uh, I think self education of self uh, can, uh, can permit uh, study and researching how teachers feel uh, in a crisis situation and what it to tell for us about the teacher professional and what we can uh, think of for teacher training. Um, in that situation that you are living today uh, in a pandemic situation by COVID-19, I think that two questions we have to ask that is very important to think about education uh, for future. So uh, uh, it, it's, it's common, it, it's usually, usually that excluded students uh, in this situation turn into invisible students because they don't have uh, material conditions to, to, to deal with virtual classes and so uh, if they are excluded in a present presence classrooms, they are advisable in uh, virtual classes. Uh, the other point, and I, I, and I, I thought, uh, uh, how can teachers access them? How can teachers access these students that don't have material conditions to uh, take virtual classes? And it implies the teacher's uh, identity process. And the other question is, uh, in this situation, school goes to families' houses. So uh, in a virtual classes, uh, family is more is closer to teachers' uh, way of teaching, and uh, how teachers feel exposed in the situation, how teachers uh, uh, feel evaluated by family, uh, in, in in the case that the the, the children and adolescents are, are taking class in their houses, and uh, I think this this situation. Uh, is uh, have a possibility to think about how heterogeneity, heterogeneity implies the way in teachers working, uh, thinking about working of schooling and their identities. And it's, it's very important because uh, uh, teachers uh, usually think about a classroom as a homogeneous space. So in this situation, they face it that each student have a different condition to take virtual classes and have different uh, conditions to have parents support them. So uh, it's, it's a, a very important time to think about how heterogeneity is the classroom is. And uh, the other point I think it's important to discuss is how teachers are, are ne neglected from public policies. Uh, this time is, is, is more, is more uh, clear to see that teachers are not asked what is the better way to deal with this situation. We have just uh, some, some uh, laws that uh, tells teacher, teachers how, how, how they can deal with the situation and they don't participate at all. And uh, the, the way uh, teachers are exposed in some way by families' houses can uh, permit a, a kind of evaluation of the, this, this this job, and I, I don't know, and I was wondering how teachers feel about this. And uh, there is some theoretical contributions that I want to bring uh, to our discussion, just because my work is initial, and I don't, don't have any data to share with you, just some theoretical contributions, to understand the crisis as a path to development. So uh, as teacher's identity is a processual relation between subject and in a power relations, relation crisis could uh, uh, turn into new conceptions about education that is related to inequality. And 
I think it may be contribute to another concept that teacher, teachers can start to think about the classrooms and uh, how is the function of education in our country. And I, I think that is, in, that is in, a, in a crisis situation, teachers uh, also have a necessity to, to, to overcome challenges that uh, implies a political position, uh, a decision about what kind of education uh, we want to achieve. And this is not a simple form to, to build another kind of policy for, for education, but how teachers can participate in this, in this, in this change moment that have to, 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 to deal with specific goals, with uh, clear goals that want to achieve in, in a crisis situation. And I think that it's, uh, uh, we can consider teachers' identity as a, a process that is important to, to discuss about new policies and political positions that we have to do. And here, uh, some reference that I used in my job. Uh, and I, I am grateful for you all to be here and discuss these topics. And thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. I think it just uh, Alex, don't come. Does it come? People, just I mean, I have to put my my computer because my battery is low. Just a bit, please. So I think we have about seven minutes for questions. Um, I wonder what? if people, we have about seven minutes for questions. I so, wonder if, if any of the attendees, um, if you have questions, if you can type them in the chat maybe. Um. Sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. No problem. In this moment, we don't have any question chat. Uh, there is um, two chats, but no, no, no one question. Okay, uh, maybe we have to make questions for each other. <laughs> and uh, I really want to, to ask you, Claire, about uh, the your job and uh, the 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 union of teachers in US and uh, I, I don't know if uh, I get and uh, if I understand well but I want I want to know how how teachers uh, in in New York I think in New York was the city that you are uh, researching and uh, I, I, I really want to know how, how teachers, uh, uh, when, when, when this, this union is started, I don't know if they get well. Your microphone is yeah. off. Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, so teacher unions have been around for a very long time in the US since 1880s, even when there were other movements in manufacturing, mainly men, teachers were trying to form unions. Actually, the very first like feminist organizations were teachers unions in, in Chicago at the time. They weren't legally recognized until the 1960s and 70s. So in that way, their modern form is very, it's, that's very recent. In Newark, 
the teachers union has a very interesting history because it was founded by communists, Jews in the 20s and 30s. <laughs> and at the time it was like, we don't want to say that we're Jew, uh, we don't want to say that we're Jewish or just going to say that we're communist. <laughs> um, and, um, and very early on, they understood that even if it was a union of teachers, it couldn't just be about the classroom, about pay or benefits or all of that, that it had to be about the broader things of the city because it's very difficult to strike as a teacher, as you know. When you don't go to work, your parents and the city are really mad and they knew they had to build strong alliances. And that's kind of the tradition where Newark comes from. Thank you very much. Uh, concerning uh, unions, teachers' unions, uh, we testify all around the world uh, a strong movement against unions. Uh, in Brazil, for instance, since a pair of years ago, we, it's a, it was kind of mandatory that all workers uh, contributed uh, a small contribution every month to the unions and, and uh, before there was a, a major uh, labor reform here and one of the changes was uh, freeing workers of the, the, the need to contribute with unions. How is uh, this issue in the US today? Yeah, teachers, teacher unions have been under attack since they were created. Um, since 2012, it's just but in crescendo, it's gotten worse and worse, which is part of why I think we're seeing actually more teachers strike is because they're having to fight back. They understand that if if they're not very if they're not organized, then they'll just disappear altogether. Mm -hmm. I I would like to hear the three of you uh, about uh, an issue that I think that kind of transversalizes the three presentations. That's the way uh, you um, uh, treat the concept of crisis. I think that there, are, there is at least three different perspectives in the works concerning this concept, and I would like to hear you uh, three, please. Uh, I, if I uh, clearly understood, in Claire's presentation, there was an idea of a crisis as an exceptional a situation, something that, that uh, some event or process that's kind of out of order, a way of uh, being different of the natural order of events, or an exception maybe. Uh, in, in Ruth, she, I, I think that there is a kind of a future-oriented perspective of crisis, the idea of the the current situation concerns the, the virus and the pandemic uh, crisis uh, would lead to possibly positive outcomes in terms of transformation of the, the schooling of the school settings. And uh, in Ana, Ana Luisa's perspective, a more Vygotskinian perspective in crisis as a path for development. Uh, would you please elabor elaborate a little bit more in terms to, to, to think uh, what this moment we are living can be uh, used as kind of a theoretical reflection yeah, for developmental psychology or general psychology, psychology or environmental psychology uh, that's class perspective and help us to think the, the the positive uh, effect of uh, uh, this pandemic to think about development? We start. Okay. If you want to, you can speak in Portuguese and I, I translate to Claire if, if, if it's better for you. Or if you want to, to try to speak in English, Feel free to do that. Go ahead. I understand some Portuguese, actually. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> I, understand, I understand Spanish and French. So if you put, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Good to know. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, in your work, uh, the, the crisis can be an opportunity for the, for the teacher to think uh, about himself. 
uh, and the advance in the use of ICT uh, because they are realize how the technology is important to, in our days. Uh, it's, in, it's impossible to um, to maintain a class uh, in the world, uh, hyper-connected world. Uh, in this moment, uh, of course, no way is possible to do uh, the same methodology, adopt, adopt all the same methodology for all levels, the learning, but um, it's an important moment to reflection the, the use of ICT as a mediator, uh, semi, um, semi mediation. Semiotic. Semiotic yes. mediator. <laughs> Semiotic in, the, in this moment. Um, my perspective is probably the most outward or the most from the social sciences and the least from psychology in particular. Um, but what I have been working with a lot um, in my graduate program is the concept of ontological security, um, which is the sense that the world around us is tr trustworthy and constant. And a crisis is any event, whether prolonged or short with a beginning and an end, that interrupts that sense that the world is trustworthy mm -hmm. and constant. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I I don't think if if I have uh, too much theoretical uh, staff to <laughs> to answer these questions, but uh, just what I was wondering that uh, I, I don't think that a kind of order in development or in society is exists at all. Uh, I think that uh, crisis is uh, 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 a, a part of the whole, and uh, I, I also don't think that crisis is uh, a romantic view. That uh, oh, so now we we are in the crisis in a crisis, so we have to be better. No, I, I don't think so. But as a part of a whole, uh, as a, a, a in a. a this part of this whole is is there is no way to refold uh, to to from from crisis uh, also in development or also in society i i think it's crisis is up it's something that we live with it in our everyday mm -hmm. uh, we have a question in the question and answer uh, um, window. Can I read it for you girls? Please. Good afternoon. I am Pina Marsico. Thanks for your presentations. At the beginning of the lockdown, I hoped that the, a new hum, humanism was coming, but now I have less hope and I am seeing a lot of inequalities and no one is really interested in overcoming these differences. What is the role of education of, of, education of the future? Uh, what we are educated for. Um, so I think this is a question that I struggle a lot in, with in my work um, because I don't, I don't know very much about educational psychology or developmental psychology, but I do think a lot about what it means to be a teacher in a city where there's the unemployment rate for certain parts of the population is 50%. Um, even people who go to university do not get good jobs. Probably the best jobs that you can get is in the military. Um, and on top of that, there's poisoning in the water. Um, you know, there's a clear devaluation of human life. And with climate change, even like bigger than that, there's a sense of like the foreclosure of any possible future. And I think that that provokes a crisis in identity that Ana Luisa was talking about, which is if there's a sense that you're educating to people to either towards upward mobility or towards a fulfilling life, that doesn't necessarily exist um, in a city that's in a state of crisis. And I think that's part of the reaction that we're seeing from teachers today. And it's also part of the reason in the US why we have a teacher shortage, actually. Not, there's not enough teachers. And teachers only last two or three years often before they quit. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, maybe 
I have some some contribution to this question, uh, but uh, I think that uh, there is no consensus between teachers, and I, I'm talking about in Brazil's context, and uh, it's very difficult to to build some some consensus, some something that all teachers in a school can can agree with each other each other it's very difficult to to do that and uh, imagining in a crisis situation that all the world was facing uh, a kind of need to transformation and uh, i i i I think that is the moment that we have to think about what kind of education we want uh, to build in what kind of society. This, uh, uh, what Claire said about uh, how teachers quit for of the, their profession, uh, it's a, 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 a point that shows us how we don't know what kind of education we want. So if you, if you don't know as teachers, if you don't know as policies, I, I don't know uh, where we can, can go with this thinking. Uh, and I'm also a little bit pessimist <laughs> today, but uh, uh, <laughs> but there is a little bit, a little bit of hope in, in my heart that uh, I, I, I know that there is some people thinking really uh, uh, very hard how, how to achieve uh, a way to continue continuing uh, our lives in, in, in this planet. <laughs> and I think education is a pathway to this. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how. It's a very difficult question to answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, of course, it's a, a difficult question. Um, but I'm, my position is um, opt optimi optimist. Uh, optimist, yeah. <laughs> um, I believe the education has the social function, has a social function uh, of reduced social inequalities. Um, the, despite of the, the challenges, I believe can, we can lose hope and continue to, to fight to, to get um, all the results and uh, the opportunity to think uh, what can do different because uh, if you, nowadays we are insatisfied, uh, we failed in the past. And, um, what we can do now to to get results different results mm -hmm. uh, i'll just make a very brief comment on this topic of the first question and then we have a, a second one uh, there is a very strong philosophical and developmental principle that's the 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 the, the idea that there is no way back it's not possible to, to, to go back to the initial point, uh, to go back to the lost normality. And I think that uh, due to this principle, it's absolutely uh, unpredictable that we will uh, pass by all these so drastic, so dramatic uh, processes of crisis, of this more radical moment of crisis we are living in without some uh, meaningful transformation of social relationships. I am not, uh, I am nor optimistic nor pessimistic. <laughs> I think that will change, but I am not able to say that these changes will be better or worse because this kind of judgment we will only be able to do it when time is uh, passed and we can look back to this experience maybe into 10 years or 20 years and we will be able to see, oh, how interesting it was. Oh, I was there, I was part of that and I could somehow contribute to this change. I think that we have 
all the moment because it's so dramatic that no one of us have the power to, to determine only by the perspective of our own intentionality, agency, or what, whatever, to control these so complex and systemic processes. But all of us can reflect upon that and try to make our role to position ourselves in a point to contribute to a, a, a more optimistic or humanistic or critical or whatever perspective we cohere with, we, are, we adhere to in terms of changing reality. For instance, to, to help children not to, to dream on being part of the army <laughs> as clear as the top of the, <laughs> the social mm -hmm. alternatives, but as a more transformative, creative, innovative perspectives in the future. So let's see, there is another question. Would you like me to, to read it or some of you would look and no. see? Mm. We have no. here, the, uh, okay. the use of technologies is quite dilemmatic. We need them, but they, they can come a new instrument for disequalities. This is for Huch. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, of course, it's an uh, instrument uh, <laughs> to these equalities. Uh, yeah, because of that, we need to, to be a patient all the time to, to make different, uh, uh, to be an instrument of uh, quality. Vou falar em português, tá, Maria Cláudia? Você traduz? Ok. Os os instrumentos, as tecnologias, elas podem ser usadas tanto para, para, para produzir desigualdades quanto para, para produzir igualdades. É, então, the depende... <risos> é, é, technologies, they can be used both to produce é, equality and inequalities. Sim. É, e... Então, depende, da, no, no nosso caso, né? estamos no contexto da, da educação, é, depende da forma como os professores, como a gestão da escola, como os produtores de políticas é, podem ver nessas tecnologias um, um poder de inclusão social. Concerning educational context, it all depends on the forms, teachers, eh, managers and eh, educational policies uh, transform technologies into instruments of social inclusion. Sim. Por exemplo, nesse momento, nós estamos no Brasil com, com situações de, de, de muitas crianças sem acesso e adolescentes sem acesso à internet e, e foi uma está sendo uma política, por exemplo, de fazer parcerias com empresas é, para liberar o sinal, para não aumentar, por exemplo, diminuir o valor da conta, então esse tipo de, de, de ação governamental pode ser uma forma de produzir um pouco mais de igualdade, um pouco mais de acesso, que em um momento fora da pandemia não seria possível. Muito longa essa frase, peraí. É, for instance, at the moment in Brazil, there are some kind of partnership between uh, the government and local companies or cell phone companies in terms of uh, funding the access of students who have been out of uh, access to access to digital education in this period, or for instance, reducing the taxes for use of internet access to, to so that students are able to have uh, digital classrooms, to be part of digital classrooms. Mm, I think I responded, Sarah. That's it. <laughs> I would like to, to uh, in addition, talk, uh, talk with uh, you all uh, because I, I don't know if, if, if even teachers have the condition, the material conditions to, to, to take virtual classes because uh, I, was wonder, I was thinking that when I was a, a, a teacher in basic schools at Brasilia, Brazil, uh, I, I, I always heard by my colleagues what, how, how they ex, 
spent their their free time doing houseworks, doing uh, ca uh, taking care of their, chi their their children, and doing all all the things that is uh, uh, aspects from a uh, uh, inequality society between men and women, for example. And uh, I don't know if even teachers have the condition to, to, to deal with the situation that we have a lot of classes, virtual classes, and a lot of different students to, to uh, 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 take these classrooms. And I, I really don't know uh, if it, there, there is only children, only adolescents that have difficult to deal with virtual classes with technology or teachers in, in the way of we are in an inequality society have also difficult to deal with technology. Not how they don't know how to deal with some computer or program, but how they uh, organize their routines, consider the fact that teachers are almost uh, uh, women and women have uh, different, different uh, 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 I don't know how to say it in English, but responsibilities in their houses. That mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. yes, that is in our country. For example, in Brazil, we know that teachers are almost women and they have to do other things uh, rather than work at school as teachers. I think you traz two questions. You will traduce, Maricon? I have to talk more. Mas, tipo... é, você tra... curta, por favor. Tá. <risos> eu não consigo. Acho que você traz, traz duas questões. Uma, como que o professor, de maneira geral, lida com seus adolescentes que têm graus variados de uso e acesso às tecnologias? There are two issues concerned with on your commentary. The first one is the, the concerns how adolescents deal with technologies. E a outra é como que o professor agora, na pose, né, sendo mulher, uma professora, é, com todos os seus papéis, com toda a, sua, a soma de seus papéis, ela vai conseguir produzir o que tem que produzir e dar atenção aos seus alunos, não é isso? E a segunda one concerns, the, the first one, let me uh, reframe it. The first one is how teachers deal with the use adolescents do of technologies. And the second one is the difficulties that maybe uh, female teachers have for the fact that most of them, at least in Brazil, deals with uh, uh, doing home stuff, taking care of children, and in a kind, this is myself who is telling in a kind of a very sexist culture we have in Brazil, misogynist, where women have more duties than men uh, concerning homework. Uhum. Eu acho que primeiro a gente tem que pensar que a, a tecnologia ela tem que vir para facilitar o trabalho. Né? Inicialmente é óbvio que o professor por não saber mexer e está muito acostumado aos parâmetros da, 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 da sala de aula presencial, ele tem que dar um passo à frente e, av e avançar nesses usos. Mas... De... <risos> the, uh, the, the, the very first point is that the function of technologies is to make life easier so that uh, to, 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 to give the first step, né, to have the first step for teachers to, to have their work as teachers easier, they have to prepare to it. Isso. Uh, então, por exemplo, algum tempo atrás nós tínhamos uh, dificuldades, por exemplo, de usar o celular, hoje não mais, já superamos. Assim, cada, a cada nova tecnologia que vai surgindo, a gente lida com essas próprias que a gente chama de affordas, são os limites, as potencialidades daquela tecnologia, para ela agregar ao nosso fazer. Uh, we note that every new technology we deal with, uh, they turn the technology before that one easier to take care, uh, to, to use it. Uh, they kind of improve the affordances each of these uh, technologies provide people to, to benefit from it in different contexts, for instance. Sim. Então, e nesse sentido, é, respondendo a primeira 
primeira parte da pergunta, o que os alunos têm graus diferenciados de uso das tecnologias, aí é uma questão muito mais ampla de política pública, é, para dar acesso, e enquanto não é possível é, todas as crianças e todos os adolescentes terem acesso, os professores se colocarem na posição dos estudantes, conhecerem os seus estudantes, é, e, por exemplo, usar a tecnologia, pode gravar a aula ou pode produzir alguma, algum, algum material usando a tecnologia e passar para esse aluno de alguma forma, para ele não ficar... Eu vou tentar, Ruth, eu vou tentar, mas está difícil, porque é um texto muito longo, tem que ser frases é, mais sim. curtas, mas vamos lá. É, the first one é, concerns a, more, a broader political problem that's the different... É, Uh, conditions uh, uh, to access technologies and how different age groups deal with it and the necessity of teachers to be more sensitive to these different uses for pedagogical means or in, in educational contexts. And the second one? Sim, em relação às professoras, é que de fato tem, tem muito, muitos papéis uh, sociais eu concordo, não é um desafio, a gente sabe, né, nós, nós todas somos mães aqui, é, quer dizer, eu sou mãe, Maria Cláudia mãe, a Ana, não sei, né, e nem a Clé, mas, é, sim, a gente tem que lidar com isso, e eu acho que a gente tem que contar com a parceria, né, de quem vive, com a, nossos filhos, a parceria deles, a parceria do marido, se tiver marido, a parceria, enfim, é, de, outras, de outras pessoas que vivem na casa, para poder ajudar. Né? e compartilhar esses desafios também com a gestão da escola, porque, sim, é um problema que não é só meu, é seu, é do outro, né? A gente vê que, a, que as mulheres estão compartilhando os mesmos problemas, então tem que ter uma solução também no nível, né? No mesmo uhum. nível. É, kind of translating and uh, adding some ideas to Ruth's position, uh, she said, né, at first, that, that It, this is a very complex situation that most of us who are women and who are teachers and who are mothers and who are married sometimes uh, deal with in our profession in Brazil and it's uh, 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 an issue of trying to develop networks that can help us, she said at first. And then I would say that's forming a network to help us to, to change Uh, the, the prevalent meanings concerning uh, female roles in society so that we cannot need help, but we need, we, we have partnership, we have sharing, we had a uh, fair division of home uh, duties and so on and so forth. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You know that I have <laughs> a different understanding of these issues, although I know that in Brazil, for instance, if someone uh, I, was, I am saying, uh, being an elementary school teacher is a very uh, badly paid function in society. We had very uh, small wages as elementary school schools so that most of this, these women have uh, difficulties to, to pay for services that could, would help them to be good teachers and to, to kind of solve some domestic problems. So most of them had kind, have kind of two or three rounds of uh, duties at school, at home, as, as mothers, as wives and so on and so forth. We call that the second shift here. Yes, yes. Um, I think. I think. I'm a little bit. <laughs> we have done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm a little bit more pessimistic. I think the, one of the things that's specific to capitalism is that technology is an industry in itself. Innovation is a goal in itself. Um, and to that extent that it is a product and a commodity, Uh, human labor is always going to be in service of technology, not the other way around. Um, and so even though there's nothing inherent about technological tools that are alienating or dispossessing, in capitalist society, they will be. And the fact that we train sooner or, uh, or later, once we reach a certain stage of technological advancement, you need whole schools and curricula like 
MIT or Caltech or even high schools now that are science and technology high schools to educate people to innovate because that's the like the, you know that is the defining feature in industry of late stage capitalism. Um, I'm not super optimistic because the wage of the rate of profit will continue to go down and wages mm -hmm. will continue to go down and labor will continue to mm -hmm. be more precarious even in those fields. So yes, I mean, that's a better. Uh, uh, that's a point, Claire. The, the, all the discourse on innovation has been historically based on this kind of economicist perspective on innovation mm -hmm. as a commodity, as you have mm -hmm. mentioned. And one of the challenges we have posed to, to Ruth is to think in terms of innovation as a kind of a, a commonwealth perspective, as a, a way of creatively and uh, future-orientedly perspective of dealing with uh, daily challenges and work challenges, much more concerned with self-development through work than attending to a, a cap capitalist perspective and goal né, externally imposed upon people. É isso, Ruth? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is cool. one of the points she's aiming at with her PhD project. Yeah. Good. No more question? I don't think so. Hello. Mm -hmm. Then maybe for your work then, Richard, there's um have you read uh oh man, I'm forgetting her name. Uh she, Mariana uh What's her name? She writes about the public sector and revaluating where does value come from? Okay, I'm gonna send it to you <laughs> offline, but, but it's very, it's like, it's rethinking because also part of the dichotomy between the public sector and the private sector is that the private sector can innovate, but the public sector is this monster, slow bureaucrat. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and she says, well, if we had a different perspective on how value is created, then we may not think that. Um, because nice. there's a lot of innovation in the public sector. That's a different kind of innovation. Uh, interesting. Good. Yeah, send to me, please. The name of the... The value of everything, no, I think it's called. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you That's all. It. That's Thank you. Yes. Bye-bye. Right. Take care, everybody. Bye -bye. See you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. for this very good discussion. Yes. I think that the presentations were as good as what came after uh, the presentation. Thank you for the questions, Pina, Santos, and other participants that are still here with us. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Nice to meet you, Claire. Nice to see you. Nice to meet you. Nice to, to meet you, Maria. Ana. Hope to see you again in Brasil or in yes. Salvador. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? I hope so. Bye-bye. <laughs> so, bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.